Well, good evening, everybody. A warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Mark Searcy. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Science, and it's a great pleasure to be here tonight introducing uh, Carol Robinson. Carol began her academic career after graduating as a marine biologist from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in 1982. She stayed on at Newcastle to complete a PhD in civil engineering with a focus on assessing the use of marine microbes to produce the biogas methane as a byproduct during the treatment of high salt containing industrial wastewaters. During her PhD, she also learned to scuba dive and spent her spare time organizing and leading a Royal Geographical Society sponsored expedition to the Caribbean to study the coral reefs there. And why wouldn't you? She then moved to a postdoctoral position at the University of Wales, Bangor, to study plankton primary production and respiration. This involved learning computer coding in order to develop a computer con controlled instrument to measure dissolved inorganic carbon in seawater. Her high resolution measurements of carbon were some of the first to show the variability in the flux of carbon between the atmosphere and the ocean, and how this flux is strongly modulated by plankton activity. She was lucky enough to undertake this research in the Mediterranean and Arabian Seas and the North and South Atlantic, and also spent three months on an Australian Antarctic base, always investigating the link between plankton activity and the cycling of carbon dioxide. She did her best to incorporate diving into her research as much as, as much as possible, including diving under Antarctic sea ice to measure oxygen uptake and production by plankton, and on a hydrothermal vent off a Greek island in the Aegean Sea to determine the effect of increased carbon dioxide and temperature on plankton production and respiration. From Bangor, Carol moved to the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, first as an NERC Advanced Research Fellow and ultimately as the Head of Science for Biogeochemistry. During this time, she was awarded, awarded the first Marine NERC Consortium grant for a project known as the Atlantic Meridian, uh, Meridional <laughs> Transect Program. This involved managing 45 co-investigators, postdoctoral researchers and PhD students from six partner UK institutions. The aim was to complete 60 40-day research cruises between the UK and the Falkland Islands, quantifying the nature and the causes of ecological and biogeochemical variability in the planktonic ecosystems of the tropical and temperate Atlantic Ocean. Before leaving PML, Carol led a successful proposal for AMT to become part of the UK's National Marine Research Facility, and the annual AMT cruises continue to this day, with number 29 heading south to Pontas Arenas as we speak. As well as progressing the scientific ob objectives, AMT cruises provide a framework for international collaboration, training of the next generation of oceanographers, and trialing of, new, of new state-of-the-art instrumentation. In 2007, Carol moved from PML to UEA in order to have more interaction with PhD students and early career scientists and develop her love of teaching. She leads a team studying the role of marine bacteria, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton in the global cycling of carbon and oxygen. And her work involves laboratory and field observations, satellite remote sensor sensing, numerical models, underwater gliders, and time series data sets. Carol is a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology and past president of the Challenger Society for Marine Science. She's the chair of the Scientific Steering Committee of the International Integrated Marine Biosphere Research Project, which has international project offices in Bergen, Norway, and Shanghai, China, and a mission to understand and quantify the state and variability of marine ecosystems, predict and project future ocean-human interactions, and move towards to sustainable ocean governance. Carol's an enthusiastic teacher and communicator of marine science, and organises an annual two-day weekend introduction to oceanography course, open to anyone with an interest in the marine environment. She takes every opportunity to improve her own teaching skills, and earlier this year was awarded an MA for a thesis on teaching students how to reflect on their performance and learn from their mistakes. Carol became a professor of marine sciences in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Professor Carol Robinson to give her inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Mark. 
and thank you very much to the university for this rare opportunity to present my research, past, present and future, and also to say thank you so much to the mentors and collaborators that have helped me along the way. So when I... That's a good start. They did, they did say that this had been happening throughout the, throughout the campus. Great. So as I was putting together this uh, presentation, I realised that there had been three pivot points in my education which led to me being here today. And the first one occurred in secondary school when I realised just how amazing microbes are. So I was completely in awe of the bacteria and the yeasts and the fungi upon which we depend for cheese making, wine making, brewing, um, wastewater treatment and of course health and disease. And I was incredibly lucky to have an excellent biology teacher and also the flexibility in the A-level syllabus, which enabled me to undertake an individual project on industrial microbiology. So this was my opportunity to learn how exciting it is to <coughs> investigate a topic driven entirely by your own curiosity. And here on the right, you can see my first drawing, or I suspect a tracing of a, uh, a microbe, an amoeba. So the first thing I realized was that these microbes that you cannot see are incredibly beneficial to us. Thank you. So the second pivot point was at university where I studied zoology at Newcastle. And here I realized how interesting marine microbes were. So in order to understand marine microbiology, you need to be multidisciplinary. You need to understand the chemistry of the seawater, which provides the food for the microbes. You need to understand the physical oceanography, which uh, gives an impression of where and when the distribution of these microbes occur. You also need to know about ecology because of competition and uh, predator-prey relationships. And you also need to know about human behaviour, as in how we use the marine environment for food and for leisure. So I was privileged enough to spend the final year of my undergraduate degree at the Dublin Marine Laboratory in Colourcoats on the northeast coast of the UK, having lectures from Jack Buchanan on the cycling of dissolved organic material and from Barbara Brown, who inspired us with her work on coral reefs. And I also had the privilege to go to an undergraduate marine science field course in Orielton in Wales in my final year, during which I realised that I wanted to be a marine scientist and I signed up there and then for a scuba diving course. So the second thing I learned was that uh, you needed to be multidisciplinary if you wanted to be a marine microbiologist. And the third thing that happened was I realised just how important the progress in technology and development is for progress in science development. So I undertook a PhD where I wanted to isolate bacteria and archaea from marine sediments that produced methane. And I wanted to put these into an anaerobic digester that broke down high salt content industrial wastewaters to produce methane, which could be a, an extra energy source. Unfortunately, the equipment that I required for this PhD didn't arrive until my final year. So I was entirely dependent on this technology. And I also, of course, then learned how to be quite resourceful because I needed to use other techniques in the first three years of that PhD. So throughout my career, I've been looking at how marine microbes affect the environment and how the environment affects marine microbes. So I've put together a schematic which gives you an impression of the context of my work. So here we are at the surface ocean and I study the diversity of the tiny plants that live in the, in the um, surface ocean. So these are so small that you could uh, end to end have somewhere between 4 and 100 across the width of a human hair. And they occur in abundances something like tens to millions in a litre of seawater. They include phytoplankton which produce an exoskeleton of calcium carbonate. 
which are ultimately uh, responsible for the White Cliffs of Dover. And they also include phytoplankton, which are responsible for shellfish poisoning. But as a group, they're important because they all photosynthesize. They take up carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen, just like the plants on land. The surface ocean is also the habitat of a diverse uh, group of bacteria and animals, tiny animals known as zooplankton. And this includes the bacteria, the crustacean copepods and krill, which are food source for juvenile fish and seals and penguins. It also includes the mollusks, these tiny snails known as pteropods, which swim with an adapted uh, foot. And it also includes the sea gooseberries and the jellyfish. And these again occur in abundances of tens to millions, and their size range is something from a hundredth of the width of a human hair right up to a few meters. And again, they have a metabolic, uh, they all characteristically respire just like us, they take up oxygen and they produce carbon dioxide. So this is why I'm calling the surface ocean and the microbes in the surface ocean the lungs of the ocean. So the complexity of the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, the interactions for competition, for predator-prey and for infection are incredibly complex. And this balance between the uh, production of phytoplankton and the uh, respiration of zooplankton and bacteria cycles carbon in, this, in the upper ocean. And this is what I'm calling the engine or the heart of the ocean. So this complexity, the ecological interactions between phytoplankton and zooplankton and bacteria are cycling carbon all of the time in the surface ocean. However, this cycling is not 100% efficient. There's a small amount of this carbon which sinks out of the upper ocean because it's dead, um, dead phytoplankton cells, fecal pellets from zooplankton and krill and even whale carcasses. And this particulate organic carbon sinks down to depth where it is remineralized, utilized by bacteria and zooplankton at depth. This is tens to hundreds to thousands of meters where uh, it gradually is broken down by bacteria which are producing carbon dioxide all of the time. So this twilight zone, this dark, cold, deep uh, ocean is where bacteria are continually breaking down particles and aggregates of organic carbon. And this is what I'm calling the food store of the ocean. So the microbes, the way that they are breaking down the carbon uh, of dissolved and particulate organic carbon are enabling the ocean to be a vast storage of organic carbon of food. So I'm going to talk about how the ocean acts as lungs, how they act as a heart or an engine, how they can act or influence the food store of the open ocean, and I'm also going to talk about how all of these processes are affected by climate change in terms of increasing temperature, increasing carbon dioxide and decreasing oxygen. So this will be the structure of the talk. We'll first of all talk about the breathing, the lungs at the surface, then the cycling within the upper ocean, then how microbes affect whether or not the ocean is a storage of food and how all of these are affected by climate change. So let's start in the upper ocean, the air-sea exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And we're going to go way, way back to the mid-1980s, when I first started being a postdoctoral researcher, where we, at that time, the data for upper ocean carbon dioxide suggested that the air-sea flux was fairly constant, fairly smoothly developed throughout season and throughout ocean basin. So I started with my first postdoctoral research project at the University of Bangor. And the thing that I did was develop this system, this state of the art system to measure dissolved inorganic carbon. And this was able to measure carbon at a much higher resolution. You were able to measure it at 10 to 15 meter minutes. And it, this is in what involved me learning coding and chemistry as well as carbonate chemistry. So I was able to use this instrument alongside Andy Watson's group, who were at that time in Plymouth measuring the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in surface water, and Mike Fashion's group, um, who measured the pigment, the chlorophyll in phytoplankton, and he was uh, at the Institute of Oceanographic Sciences in Wormley. So the three of us 
our three groups put to sea in 1989, for the first time having these three instruments together, and we were about to do a research voyage on the RRS discovery. So you can see that there was absolutely no pressure. There was a lot of media attention, and uh, because the ship was called the Discovery, this led to the headline that we were about to go on a voyage to save the Earth. So what did we find? Well, this was the spatial variability in, or, in dissolved inorganic carbon at the time that we went out on the ship. So there were something like 15 data points between about 5 degrees west and 28 degrees west and 47 degrees north to 66 north to the west of the UK. And the contours here are three micromoles per kilogram. So fairly smoothly averaged that would give us a very constant or consistent air sea exchange of carbon dioxide. So what did we find? Well, during the cruise, we were able to do a mapping exercise for 10 days when we uh, were able to compare dissolved inorganic carbon, partial pressure of carbon dioxide and chlorophyll. And you can immediately see from the, um, the figure on the left that the variability in carbon was much, much higher than you expected from this very poor data set. And the contours within this small mapping exercise that we did over 10 days is again um, three micromoles. So the variability was much, much higher than we had anticipated from these sparse data. And it also suggests that if you relied on this sparse data, then predicting the SC exchange could be in significant error. But the next thing that we found is that this high variability in dissolved inorganic carbon was also uh, synchronous with changes in chlorophyll. So when you had a high chlorophyll concentration, you had a low concentration of carbon, both um, partial pressure of carbon dioxide and dissolved inorganic carbon. So you can see that on the right hand side, the scale is for PCO2 is going upwards and on the left hand side, the scale for chlorophyll is going downwards. And those of you who know about the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will see that in 1989, the concentration in the atmosphere was something like 350 parts per million and it's currently more like 410. So two things we learned, that the variability is much higher than we expected and that there's a really close uh, relationship between the carbonate chemistry and the chlorophyll or the phytoplankton biomass. So this, these uh, findings and uh, funding from the European Commission enabled Andy to instrument a container ship that went from the UK to Jamaica, the so-called banana boat, uh, once a month and he instrumented with an instrument that was able to measure the partial pressure of carbon dioxide from a pumped seawater source from about six metres as the ship went backwards and forwards across the Atlantic. And this ship was also instrumented with a continuous plankton recorder from the Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation for Ocean Science in Plymouth. And this is a towed metal sampling body which is towed behind the ship at about six metres. The uh, water flows through the nozzle of the sampling box and through a mesh silk so that any plankton in the water is trapped onto this silk. And the water flow through the, uh, the metal box turns a propeller which gradually spools the mesh into a cassette and at the same time puts another mesh over the top of the sample. So you end up with a sandwich of plankton separated with a, a silk mesh on the top and the bottom, spooled into a cassette which can be taken back to the laboratory at the end of these long transit voyages. And this mesh is then unrolled in the laboratory, cut into uh, sized pieces which are appropriate to the amount, the volume of water that's passed through the silk, and all of the <laughs> organisms that are on that silk can be identified by a microscopy. So this goes backwards and forwards every month and we were very successful a few years ago to get NERC funding for a student ship for Claire Ossel who participated in two of these cruises to collect water samples to validate and calibrate the carbon and the oxygen measurements. 
So what she was also able to do is use now 35 years of data. I'll say that again, 35 days of data, 35 years of data, where we were able to compare the carbonate chemistry of the surface water with the plankton distribution. So over on the left-hand side, you can see the abundance of plankton, particularly a, a sort of plankton known as diatoms, the, the picture on the left at the bottom there, the diatom. And you can see that over the 35 years, the diatom abundance is increasing in the sub-Arctic uh, uh, portion of the North Atlantic, so above 47 degrees north, so red coloration at the same time as the uh, carbon dioxide air sea exchange is uh, decreasing. So we have a bigger sink of carbon dioxide when we have a greater um, increase in plankton abundance. And the opposite occurs in the subtropics below 47 north. So here we have the abundance of plankton decreasing and uh, a positive source of carbon dioxide from the water to the atmosphere. And this makes sense because with a warming sea, you have an increase in the density stratification between the surface waters and the deeper waters, which in the subpolar regions reduces the light um, limitation and because there's lots of nutrients it allows the plankton to increase and the opposite occurs in the subtropics where the uh, plankton are, have plenty of light but they don't have very many nutrients so this stratification causes them to be more nutrient limited and therefore their uh, abundance is decreasing. So this is the first data set which enables us to see just how important the plankton composition is to the carbonate chemistry and the air sea exchange of carbon dioxide. So if we really want to look at the photosynthesis and the respiration of the plankton, we need to also look at the actual metabolic processes and not just this fingerprint or signature of carbon dioxide that Claire measures. So this is a satellite image of plankton production. So you can see immediately that we have this impression, a global impression, a daily impression of the variability of plankton production. However, we don't have anything like this for plankton respiration. We can't see plankton respiration from space. So this means that usually respiration is one of the least known uh, processes in budgets and models of carbon cycling. So, always up for a challenge. This is what I decided to do for my uh, NERC Advanced Research Fellowship. So, I had three streams of research. The first was to look at the respiration of a range of different organisms. So, it might be bacteria, zooplankton, or these images are showing um, blooms of the coccolithophore, the phytoplankton that produces a calcium carbonate exoskeleton. The second thread of research was to go to particular regions of the ocean. So that might be the effect of a, a river plume on the ocean. It might be the effect of upwelling along the coast of the Arabian Sea. Or here it was the Southern Ocean where the plankton are having to cope with low temperatures and sea ice. And finally, the thread was to look at uh, temporal and spatial variability on this Atlantic Meridional Transect program that went between the UK and the Southern Ocean um, at annual um, timescales and um, covered something like 13 and a half thousand kilometers. So after 10 years of collecting respiration data alongside plankton production data, we put together a global database of plankton respiration which had something like a thousand data points. So, quite a lot of data, but you can see nothing like the amount of data that we have for primary production because we're not able to look at respiration from space. And the other worrying thing was that if you looked at where all the data that I collected was, there were not many other groups in the, in the world that were uh, taking on board the importance of measuring respiration. So, a lot of the data was collected by myself which was admirable, but obviously is not progressing us very far, very fast. So 
So one of the reasons that respiration rates are not measured very often is because of their time-consuming and quite frankly archaic method. So this involves gaining research funding to go on a large research ship, using a, uh, a sampler, a rosette of sampling bottles that's deployed over the side of the ship, filling up lots of little glass bottles with seawater, incubating them in temperature controlled dark boxes either in the laboratory or on deck, and then analysing the amount of oxygen that's been consumed by the respiration of the plankton in the bottle. And you can see that uh, eight years later, the global database now has 3,000 measurements, but there are still vast areas of the ocean where there's no data at all. So this meant that in 2009, when Sandra Martinez Garcia published a new method to measure respiration based on the cellular, cellular reduction of a, an indicator salt, INT, we were all extremely excited because this meant we wouldn't have to do oxygen incubations anymore. So you can see that here she has a good relationship between um, the oxygen consumption, the respiration derived from oxygen consumption, and the uh, formers and formation from this new indicator, INT. And this relationship covered a, a wide range of plankton production from low to moderate. So if this uh, method is appropriate, then this opened a lot of doors for us. It allows us um, to measure um, respiration on time and space scales much better than we had before because it is much more sensitive and it therefore relies on a shorter incubation and it also relies on less disruption of the plankton community. So I was really excited. I invited the group from the University of Vigo along to a project that we were looking at at the time in 2009 on the impact of coastal upwelling on air sea exchange of climate relevant gases. Really excited that this would revolutionise what we would do with respiration. But unfortunately, the method wasn't yet robust enough to be able to be exportable to a range of different habitats. So, ever the optimist, I then wrote a proposal a few years later as part of the UK Shelf Sea Biogeochemistry um, programme, and this enabled us to employ Elena Garcia Martin. So Elena had used this method during her PhD at the University of Vigo. She had something like um, 200 measurements concurrently between oxygen consumption and INT. And by participating in the SSB cruises, she added another 100 data points to this relationship. And through her meticulous and very thorough investigation of the method, we were confident that it was validated and that it would be a useful method to use. And as I say, this had great potential because we could now look at the respiration of these sinking particles and we could also look at respiration on time and space scales that had never been achieved before. However, when we started to put together all of the data that was published, we found something really unexpected. So particularly for the amount of respiration that's attributable to the tiniest cells, the bacteria, which are usually less than 0.8 of a micron in diameter. And what we saw that was that when we plotted the data from high and low plankton production regions, then the proportion of respiration attributable to these uh, bacteria, the smallest sized cells, was fairly constant. It was about 30% of the overall respiration of the plankton itself. So this made sort of sense in regions where the plankton production is fairly moderate, because in these regions are there regions where there's a high nutrient concentration and the phytoplankton tend to be larger cells and therefore we might expect that the respiration attributable to the smaller cells is something like 30% and the predominant respiration is attributable to the zooplankton and the larger algae. However, in the low production regions, these are usually the open ocean gyres that are very low in um, nutrients and where the predominant phytoplankton are actually cyanobacteria. This means that all of the autotrophs, all of the phytoplankton and all of the heterotrophs, all of the bacteria are the same size and therefore they should be in the 0.8 size fraction. 
So here you might expect that the percentage of respiration attributable to the smaller size is something like 70%, but that just didn't occur. So there's two things that could be happening here. Either the method is biased, and it's uh, entirely dependent on the type of cell and whether or not they can take up this indicator dye, or our appreciation of who are the major respirers in the ocean, because we expect them to be bacteria, needs to be completely revisited. So we've recently uh, gained funding in a project looking at remineralization of organic carbon with the acronym REMAIN to systematically look at cultures of different phytoplankton and different bacteria to see whether there's a bias in this method. Because if there's a bias, then we need to stop using the method. And if there isn't a bias, then we really need to find out who is doing the respiring in the ocean. So, so far we've uh, looked at a range of phytoplankton groups that have different cell walls, different cell structures, and we are confident that the relationship between oxygen consumption and this I and T formation is consistent. So we can refute our hypothesis that it's a phytoplankton cell structure that's affecting the uptake of I and T. So now what we're working on is a range of bacteria before we go on to check whether or not there's an effect of nutrients or perhaps an effect of organic carbon. So that was the, uh, the lungs of the ocean, the air sea exchange of the ocean. Let's now look at uh, the internal cycling of photosynthesis and respiration, this engine or heart as I called it. And here what I'm going to be looking at is the balance between photosynthesis by the phytoplankton, respiration by the bacteria and the zooplankton, and this balance is called net community production. So if photosynthesis is greater than respiration, then that means that there's a greater drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the ocean is a sink of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. If, on the other hand, respiration is greater than photosynthesis, then this means that there's more production of carbon dioxide and the ocean can be a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So this balance is really important because it affects the air sea gas exchange and it also affects the amount of carbon that can sink down to be a food store for fish. And this is where the uh, Atlantic Meridional Transect Programme comes in. So this was the first multidisciplinary project that I led and I really appreciated the, uh, the advice and the wisdom of the co-investigators on this project, which includes some of you in the audience, so you know who you are, Tim Jickles, Jill Malin, um, without whom we simply wouldn't have achieved this amazing project. So the objective within this project, my objective within this pro project was to measure respiration and production along 10 AMT cruises. So again, we were collecting a lot of data, but really this is only a single line between the UK and the Southern Ocean. We weren't able to uh, cover the whole of the basin scale, which we can cover when we use satellite imagery to look at photosynthesis. So the obvious thing that we wanted to do then is to try and extrapolate this thin line to the basin scale. So what we try to do is to find relationships between the photosynthesis to respiration ratio and things that could actually be measured from space for the satellite. And the best model that we found was a relationship between the photosynthesis to respiration against the uptake of radio-labeled carbon into particulate organic carbon and also temperature. So now we had a relationship with a parameter that can actually be measured from space. And what we wanted then to do was to extrapolate to the basin scale of this balance between production and respiration. And this is what we found. So we were pleased that we were able to see uh, seasonal variability. It was obvious that the, the balance between production and respiration changed with season. And there was also a negative relationship between uh, the net community production and climate indices, such as the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Multivariate El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. So this made sense because the, uh, the MEI is a, a multi-parameter indicator that takes into consideration air pressure and uh, temperature of the water and of the atmosphere. 
and it indicates whether or not the water is particularly uh, warm or cool in a particular year. So when you have a strong MEI, this is an El Nino year, and the waters are warmer. So again, we have uh, warmer waters increasing the density stratification, um, reducing the amount of nutrients that the phytoplankton can utilize, and therefore decreasing the phytoplankton production. So having a negative relationship between these climate indices and the balance between production and respiration gave us confidence that this extrapolation from one relationship to the world was working fairly okay. However, we have to caution that because at the same time when we're doing some work, looking at the um, balance between production and respiration, when we were comparing two of these open ocean, very low productivity regions, the North and the South Atlantic Gyre. So over on the left hand side, you can see a climatology of these 10 cruisers, data of primary production on the top, data of respiration on the bottom. And in particular, what we were trying to do was to check whether or not we could use a single relationship between production and respiration that we could extrapolate to the world. Because uh, ourselves and a range of other groups were doing just this. And they were able to extrapolate the balance between production and respiration to the world because they made the huge assumption that respiration was always related in a constant way to production. So this means that the respiration cannot be driven by organic carbon from anywhere else other than the local primary production. And this is quite a huge assumption that we wanted to test. So we thought that the easiest way to test this was to take two regions that have similar temperatures, similar nutrients, similar mixing, and if we plot the production against respiration of these two regions, then they should be the same. If they're not the same, then this means that we can refute this assumption that you can use a constant relationship between production and respiration throughout the world's oceans. And I think you can see where I'm going here. When we plot the data of respiration against production in the North Atlantic Gyre, we found that the uh, respiration was always above primary production when primary production was less than about 120 micromoles of oxygen per meter squared per day. So this suggests respiration is greater than production and the um, amount of carbon dioxide is greater than the pull down of carbon dioxide and so the ocean is a source. On the other hand, when you plot the South Atlantic Gyre here in red, you can see that respiration was always less than primary production, which suggests that the South Atlantic Gyre was always a sink. So this means we cannot use a single relationship between primary production and respiration to extrapolate to the world. We need to work out what is the scale at which we need to collect the data to extrapolate further than the region in which we actually collect the data. So where are we going next? Well, we're continuing measuring production and respiration. Our next uh, multidisciplinary project is led by Karen Hayward here at UEA and Tom Bell in Plymouth Marine Laboratory. And Piccolo aims to look at the cycling of carbon in deep, warm, relatively warm waters that upwell along the coast of the Antarctic into the Weddell Sea. The water, the carbonate in the water reacts with the uh, the biology in the upper ocean, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, the atmosphere and the ice, before the water then sinks again and forms Antarctic bottom water. And I'm particularly excited about working in this project because we can start to look at respiration and production on much greater time and space scales because we'll be using sensors on gliders, sensors on profiling floats, and even sensors on elephant seals. So the field work is in the Weddell Sea, hopefully at the beginning of 2021. So watch this space, I'll come back in a couple of years and let you know what we found. And also, what are we thinking for the, the next, the midterm um, future? So we already have research ships, we already have fleets of underwater vehicles, remotely operated vehicles, but what do we actually want in the next 10, 20, 30 years? So I told you that it's really important that technology develops at the same pace as the scientific questions develop. So the UK 
uh, funding agencies along with other countries' funding agencies are already putting together roadmaps of where technology should be heading in the next 20 or 30 years. So perhaps what we will have is semi-autonomous research ships that are powered by electric engines, by wind turbines, by solar panels, and we can all stay at home and collect the data while these research ships monitor the ocean in terms of carbonate chemistry and pollution. Let's wait and see. So moving now down from the heart, the engine, the cycling of carbon in the upper ocean, now we're going to be looking deep as the, uh, the zooplankton cells sink as they die, the zooplankton, uh, fecal pellets from zooplankton and fish, and how the microbes interact with this sinking particulate organic carbon to produce potentially a food store in the ocean. So we're really interested in what is happening in the deep ocean, this dark, cold twilight zone. And in particular, we're interested in the interactions within the microbial food web known as the microbial carbon pump. And this is because we've recently realized that the microbes in the ocean utilize the organic carbon that's most easily utilizable, but they leave behind a large store of organic carbon that they don't utilize. So this is a bit like eating a sandwich and leaving the crusts. So why would you not eat the crusts if you were particularly hungry and you didn't have anything else to eat? So what we have is organic carbon that is labile or easily utilizable by bacteria. The, that labile carbon is taken up really quickly, but what is left or what is produced is this recalcitrant or refractory dissolved organic carbon. And this pool of refractory dissolved organic carbon is of the same order of magnitude as the atmospheric carbon dioxide in the, um, in the atmosphere. <coughs> So this RDOC is something like 600 gigatons of carbon in comparison with the 750 gigatons of carbon that's in the atmosphere. So this is quite interesting because we don't really understand why the microbes are not taking up this carbon. There's a vast array, a vast diversity of different microbes and therefore there's a vast diversity of different metabolic pathways. So why would you not use organic carbon if it's there? So this organic carbon is a real complexity, a mixture of different types of organic carbon that microbes use for cell-to-cell -cell signaling, they use for chemical defense, it's released when the organisms are eaten, predated or lysed by viruses. So it's a very complex, difficult to uh, analyze mixture of organic compounds, but we're left with a number of questions that we really need to address. Why do these heterotrophic bacteria and archaea not degrade this recalcitrant dissolved organic carbon? What is stopping them from degrading it? Is it something to do with an inherent structural, unappetizable uh, inability to break down a chemical component? Or is there some environmental or biochemical constraints that prevents the cells from breaking it down? Do they need more nutrients, for example? And therefore, what environmental conditions would make this dissolved organic carbon more or less degradable? Because if we don't understand why the organisms are not utilizing the organic carbon, then we cannot maintain the status quo and, and prevent the organism for taking them up. Because what we don't want to happen is for the bacteria to take up this recalcitrant organic carbon, convert it to carbon dioxide, and completely uh, increase the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide and all the inherent climate um, problems that we have. So we have these uh, questions, and we've recently, within a working group, written papers on uh, our state-of-the-art knowledge on this microbial carbon pump and also an implementation plan of what we think we should do next. And this implementation plan includes developing technology mass spectrometers to characterize the organic carbon, to look at the processes of formation and loss of this organic carbon, linking chemical analysis with genetic analysis of microbial uh, composition, we need to think about both single and multiple interacting 
uh, drivers or stressors, whether that's temperature, carbon dioxide, oxygen, nutrients. We need to place this implementation into a global monitoring uh, scheme. So we need to be able to measure organic carbon and the liability of this organic carbon uh, routinely throughout the world's oceans. And we also need to have a framework of modeling so we can move from conceptual to process to ecosystem models. And throughout all of this, we need to make sure that our methods are standardized, intercalibrated, and that we have appropriate data access, capacity building and training. So this is what we're currently writing proposals for um, to try and address these questions and find out just why the microbes don't take up the organic carbon. So I've talked about ASC exchange, I've talked about the cycling of carbon in the upper ocean and the potential food storage of this recalcitrant organic carbon in the mid-ocean. And now we need to think about how climate change affects all of these processes. So we're thinking about increasing temperature, increasing carbon dioxide and decreasing oxygen. And I'm just going to take a couple of examples of the work that I've been involved with. First of all, temperature. So utilizing the data of primary production and respiration collected on the AMT cruises, Angel Lopez Oretia was able to derive relationships between the photosynthesis to respiration ratio and the temperature of the water column. So any metabolic rate, any growth of an organism is dependent on temperature. And the um, increase in temperature is dependent on the biomass or the size of the cell. So what Angel was able to do is to find a relationship between the respiration and photosynthesis of the cell based simply on the size of the cell from our relationship, from our data of photosynthesis and respiration and size on the AMT cruises. So they derived this relationship of photosynthesis over respiration against temperature. And you can clearly see that this relationship P over R decreases with temperature. So this shows us that respiration is much more sensitive to temperature than primary production is. And therefore, with an increasing temperature in the surface waters, the waters will become more heterotrophic, they'll produce more carbon dioxide, and they'll be less taken up by the water. And Anger was able to predict that by 2100, in a business as usual uh, scenario, the waters would take up 20% less carbon dioxide simply by this differential effect of temperature on the two processes of respiration and production. And this doesn't include the fact that an increase in temperature will also have a physical effect on the solubility of any gas in the water. So by warming the water, we'll also lose oxygen um, due to the fact that the solubility decreases. So the increase in temperature is having an effect on the amount of oxygen content in the world's oceans. And this is a study by Sunka Schmidtko, who put together all of the oxygen measurements in the world to produce this global oxygen inventory and also the change in dissolved oxygen per decade. So you can see that the greatest decrease in dissolved oxygen is happening in the North Pacific, in the South Atlantic and in the Southern Ocean, these red colours in the plot on the bottom. And they worked out that the oxygen content has decreased by something like 2% in the past 50 years. And this decrease in oxygen is related not just to solubility decreases, so it's not just the physical effect of warming water losing oxygen, but it's also due to the uh, effect of temperature on the microbial processes. So this figure shows you the predicted um, decrease in oxygen simply due to solubility. This is the red line from 0 meters down to 6,000 meters. And the black line is the actual loss in oxygen with an associated error. So you can see that the greatest decrease in oxygen is occurring somewhere between 200 and 300 metres and also between 1,000 and 2,000 metres. 
So part of the decrease in oxygen is due to solubility changes, but a large part, something like 50 to 85%, is due to other factors, whether that's a, a change in respiration, the uptake of oxygen, or whether it's a slowing down of the circulation and the overturning of water masses. And this decrease in oxygen that's been seen in these observations is predicted to continue. So the models that are put together in a, um, a coupled model into comparison project have shown that they're expecting a decrease in oxygen from 1 to 4% um, until 2100. And uh, Laurent Bopp and colleagues looked at the comparison of these models that are predicting a decrease in oxygen and suggested that this model uh, errors are quite large, particularly in the tropics. So we're predicting that the oxygen concentration is decreasing, but our error on that decrease is quite large because the different models give slightly different um, answers. And the other thing that's very interesting is that the models uh, predict only half the amount of oxygen decrease that we can actually see in the observations. So this means our models for predicting oxygen decline are missing some processes. So these could be uh, transport processes of ocean water circulation, or they could be changes in microbial respiration. Or they could be feedbacks between uh, different processes. And there are a number of processes within the microbial loop that we expect or predict could cause a decrease in oxygen. So with an increase in temperature, you have a decrease in solubility, our first process. You also have a decrease in ventilation, and so this is a decrease in mixing of deep water up to the surface. And this means that the microbes continue to take up oxygen and the water is not re-equilibrated with the oxygen in the atmosphere. We have a direct effect of increasing temperature on metabolic rates, which increases respiration. We have increasing carbon dioxide in the water, which causes a declining pH, which studies have shown will also increase respiration. We have an increase in carbon dioxide, which increases production, and this also increases respiration. Our increase in carbon dioxide has been shown to decrease the ability of these calcium carbonate forming uh, phytoplankton. So we have a decrease in the ballast effect, the sinking rate of these organisms, which means that the respiration is increasing and is occurring at a shallower depth. And we also, in this uh, anthropocenic world, are increasing the nutrients that we're putting into the oceans through atmospheric deposition and a riverine deposition. And these increasing nutrients can cause an increase in organic production and an increase in respiration. So we have a number of potential mechanisms whereby the microbial respiration can be increasing, but we don't yet have sufficient data to incorporate this into the models. So this is an ongoing project. But one thing that we really need to take into consideration is that the microbes, just like us, are able to adapt and are able to evolve. So microbes have a very short generation time. I've already said that they're very diverse, so there's a lot of functional diversity. And uh, over time, they may adapt to an increase in temperature, an increase in carbon dioxide, or a decrease in oxygen. So I told you about this differential effect between temperature on respiration and uh, production, but this didn't take into, the, into account the capacity for the organisms to adapt or evolve. And if you undertake laboratory experiments where you grow phytoplankton over generations, of hundreds of generations, you can see that actually the uh, phytoplankton adapt to an increase in temperature. And if you also take samples from field experiments in hydrothermal vents where the temperature range is something like 20 degrees, then you see that the production of the organisms normalised to the biomass is constant. So the organisms have adapted to a higher temperature. So this is work I've re recently been doing, trying to find an integrating framework that looks at metabolic rates, in particular respiration, it looks at climate change, in particular temperature, oxygen and CO2, and it tries to input the fact that these organisms can adapt and can evolve. And I think you've probably realised by now that the work that I do cannot be done by a single research group. It cannot even be done within a single country. So I work within international projects. 
And one of these is the Integrated Marine Biosphere Research Project, which I'm currently the chair of the Scientific Steering Committee. And this um, has three objectives, three grand challenges. First of all, to understand the variability of the ecosystems, the marine ecosystems, from biogeochemical cycles right through to human interactions at multiple scales, relevant to local and global questions. We then need to undertake, uh, incorporate the data on understanding and quantifying the va variability of these ecosystems into models that can predict and project the system interactions between humans and oceans in the future. And then the third challenge is really to improve the interaction between science, policy and society in order that we can achieve sustainable oceans. And this is funded by SCORE, the Scientific Committee on Oceanic Research and Future Earth. And as Mark mentioned, it has uh, international project offices in Bergen and in Shanghai. And the way that INVA progresses its science is really through a large network. So we have a number of regional programs, some of which are focused on uh, particular areas, the Arctic or the Antarctic, and some of which are global, those that look at climate impacts on oceanic top predators. Each of these regional programs has a scientific steering committee, has a science plan, and organizes regular annual conferences. We also have a number of working groups, tax task oriented, time limited working groups that look at interactions in ocean acidifying um, oceans, the continental margins, and also the human dimension. How do we interact with the marine environment? This network includes something like 2,000 different scientists from 80 countries, and we also have a network of early career scientists, the Interdisciplinary Marine Early Career Network. So this is how we internationalize our science. The science questions that we're trying to address are not able to be achieved within one research group. And INVA, just like other international uh, research networks are trying to think about where we want to be by 2030. And this includes the European Science Advisory Council and the European Marine Board. And we're also currently uh, spinning up activities for the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, the ocean we need for the future that we want. And these are some of the um, objectives of these large international projects aligned that we all would like to achieve science that provides solutions that has impact and addresses critical gaps that we want to produce this knowledge in collaboration with policymakers and practitioners that we want to create this technology driven global marine observatory with adaptive sampling and data that is freely available to everyone we need to be thinking about developing sensors our mechanisms of data handling so that the data from the instrument to the desk is as easy as possible. And we also need to implement an interdisciplinary approach. So at the beginning, I said that marine microbiology was multidisciplinary, that we needed to understand the linkages between uh, ecology, science, um, chemistry and physics. But we also need to do this science in relation to natural and social scientists, to sociologists, economists, historians, lawyers, anthropologists. And this interdisciplinarity is something that we need to uh, develop in the next generation of scientists so that we also develop ocean literacy to make well-informed decisions about the ocean. So a small part of the engagement and the interaction with society that I've been undertaking is taking part in the Global Science Opera. This is a network of school drama and music departments that put on a, a, an opera every year on a scientific topic. And a few years ago, it was all about the ocean. So the uh, school children had two minutes to make a drawing or a drama or a musical contribution of a, a storyline all about how we should preserve and sustainably use the oceans. And also a gratuitous plug for an annual weekend course, Introduction to Oceanography, that we put on here every year or so, where anyone with an interest in the marine environment can come along, uh, learn about marine science and use the equipment, including the gliders that we have in UEA. 
So you can see that this science is international. You can also appreciate that the science that I achieve can only have been done by a huge list of collaborators. So I'd like to say thank you so much. I've had a great honor and pleasure to work with uh, collaborators and uh, students and postdocs throughout the world. Thank you to those mentors and collaborators. I'd also like to say thank you so much to the officers, crew and technicians on the various research vessels that I've worked on who've kept us safe, warm, well fed and have deployed our instruments whenever we've needed, where it's been safe to do so and in some occasions mend equipment, so thank you. I'd also obviously like to thank the funders, particularly NERC, Royal Society, Leverhulme and the EU. And most of all, I'd like to thank you for having patience with me using this mouse. I hope I've given you a flavour of the beauty, the awesome diversity of marine microbes because they are beneficial. They're really important as lungs and cycling hearts and food stores of the world's oceans. We need to be multi and interdisciplinary working as social scientists with natural sciences and we need technology to understand how climate change is going to affect these awesome ecosystems. Thank you ever so much.